Hi everyone, this lesson is on a dermatological condition known as keratoacanthoma, which involves a rapid growth of a raised skin lesion with a central crater. We'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about some of the risk factors for getting this condition, some of the key characteristics with regards to the lesion, some of the stages of this condition, and also how to diagnose it and how to treat it. So this keratoacanthoma is going to look like this. It's going to be this very raised, large skin lesion with a central crater. We'll talk about this again in more detail when we talk about the clinical features of this condition. Now, keratoacanthoma has caused a lot of confusion for clinicians over many years. Now, in the past, some clinicians may have considered this a benign condition. We'll talk about the reasons why later on in this lesson. But this condition may be a manifestation of squamous cell carcinoma, which is a skin cancer. And it has been denoted more recently as a subtype of squamous cell carcinoma. So we may see a designation like this, squamous cell carcinoma, keratoacanthoma subtype. So that can be related to a squamous cell carcinoma, a skin cancer that would look more like this. There are particular key unique characteristics with regards to this particular skin lesion though. Some of these include the fact that it grows extremely rapidly, which is unusual for a squamous cell carcinoma. It originates from the pilosebaceous gland or a pilosebaceous unit, which is simply the hair follicle with its associated sebaceous gland. It is low grade, so it's less likely to grow and spread and metastasize. And it occurs, this rapid growth occurs over several weeks of time. So very, very rapid growth. Now, there does seem to be a preponderance for this skin lesion in male patients more than female patients. Male to female ratio is two to one, so males are at twice the risk for getting this as females are. Now this condition is going to occur later on in life. Most often it's going to occur between the ages of 50 to 69. That's going to be the age group where there is peak incidence of this condition. But on average, the average age of onset is going to be 67, and it's going to be extremely rare in younger patients. Below the age of 20 is going to be extremely, extremely rare to actually see the skin condition. And it's going to be more likely in individuals with a lighter skin complexion, so there's increasing risk with decreasing skin pigmentation. This has likely to do with the fact that UV light damage is a possible etiology of this condition. This is going to tie in with the decreased skin pigmentation, but we'll talk about this in more detail in the next slide when we talk about risk factors. So let's talk about some of those risk factors. Some of these include skin injury, so any damage to the skin, perhaps by chemical exposure, that is a potential risk factor. We mentioned UV light as a potential risk factor, so we're going to often see this in sun-exposed regions of the skin. This is going to be in the majority of cases, but as we will see, some cases can occur in other parts of the skin that are not sun exposed. We'll talk about those briefly a little later on. Another risk factor is infection with human papillomavirus, especially serotypes 9, 11, 13, 16, and 18. If patients have had prior use of vemurafenib, which is a chemotherapy targeting BRAF mutations in melanoma, so if a patient has had previous treatment of melanoma with vemurafenib, they're more likely to have this condition later on. Certain workplace hazards and exposures like pitch and tar, if they're exposed to those, this can lead to potential skin damage and increase the risk. Cigarette smoking is another risk factor. Having certain genetic conditions, examples include Muratori syndrome and xeroderma pigmentosa. So Muratori syndrome is a condition similar to Lynch syndrome where we are going to have increased risk of colon cancer and along with this some skin lesions including keratoacanthoma. Any genetic mutations in P53 or HRAS have been associated with this condition as well and being immunosuppressed. So having severe diabetes, having HIV or AIDS, or being on immunosuppressive agents can also increase the risk for having keratoacanthoma. Now let's talk about the clinical features of this skin lesion. So a lot of times this skin lesion is going to start off quite subtly. We again talked about the fact that it originates in the pilosebaceous unit. It can often start out small, round, flesh-colored, or slightly off-colored. It can be a papule, so it's going to be a raised skin lesion, less than 5 millimeters or less than 10 millimeters in diameter. So it's going to start out something somewhat inconspicuous, but over time we can see a rapid growth. 
into something that looks like this. So when we actually do see this present, patients can come into clinic and have all of a sudden this large growth within only a few weeks time. What we will notice about this skin lesion is that as mentioned before, it has a central crater. This is actually a keratinous plug. So it's a plug of keratin material. It's going to be dome shaped. So it can be described as crater form. So it can look like a dome with a crater. So it's crater form. It is going to often be flesh colored or again, slightly off colored. And it's going to be one to two centimeters in diameter on average. So in some cases it can be larger. So these skin lesions can be very, very large. Most of the time, it's going to be one to two centimeters in diameter. Again, as mentioned before, there's a rapid growth over several weeks. And the most common places that this occurs are on the head, neck, and arms. But we can see this occurring in different subtypes, which we won't discuss here in this lesson, but certain subtypes of this can include a subungual subtype, which means that it occurs under the tongue. Some can occur in the mouth, some can occur in the perennial area or in the groin area. So they don't always have to occur on sun exposed areas like the head, neck and arms. They can occur in other non sun exposed areas. So that's something to think about as well. And in some subtypes, they can be pruritic. So there can be a generalized sporadic eruption of Pratoacanthoma where a particular subtype is very itchy. So pruritic means itchy. And that particular subtype is known as generalized eruptive keratoacanthoma of Grzybowski. So that's one particular subtype that can cause a pruritic or itchy lesion. So we mentioned the fact that it starts out small, it can be a very small raised papule that can progress within a few weeks to grow rapidly into that crateriform lesion we just showed. There are actually three stages that have been recognized with this condition. So we talked about the proliferation stage before, so starting with that papule, and then within a few weeks time, that expansive rapid growth into that crateriform skin lesion we just showed, that would be the maturation stage. In that stage, Oftentimes, that stage can last for six to eight weeks or longer, and that's where the skin lesion is stable in that crater form appearance. So that raised dome-like shape with the crater, that keratinous plug, that can last for six to eight weeks or longer. And then in some cases, it can involute on its own. It can regress spontaneously. So over the course of weeks, it can actually regress on its own, and that would be what we would call the involution stage. And again, this involution can occur over weeks to months of time. So often up to six months, for instance. So that's going to lead us into the diagnosis and treatment of this condition. So diagnosis is going to involve a history and physical exam. So we're going to ask the patient, how long has this taken to grow? Was it just there, you know, within a couple weeks? We're also going to want to check to make sure that Certain localized lymph nodes are not swollen as well, so that can be important to make sure that there's no obvious signs of metastasis from this. An excisional biopsy is going to be required for a pathological analysis, so we are not going to do a shave biopsy, which would just be shaving the top layer. We're often going to dig a little deeper to get a better sample for pathological analysis. That will often come back with a squamous cell carcinoma, keratoacanthoma subtype, designation. So once it's diagnosed, the treatment can involve several different methods. Some clinicians may simply wait and observe this particular skin lesion because, as I mentioned before, some can involute, some of these can regress on their own spontaneously over the course of four to six months, sometimes up to a year. And what we will notice is that there often will be a residual scar from this. So that's one method, although most clinicians will actually want to resect this because, as we mentioned before, this is now considered a potential subtype of squamous cell carcinoma. So it's going to be often resected. It won't be left to wait. It'll be resected. And again, it's going to be excised with four millimeter margins. In some cases, if it's smaller, electrodesiccation, curatage can be utilized. If it's a bit larger, Mohs micrographic surgery can be utilized. And there are questions of whether or not non-surgical methods may be employed. Most of the time, it's going to be surgical. It's going to be excised. It's not going to be left to be observed. It'll be excised. But there have been some case reports showing some potential effectiveness of non-surgical methods, including topical 
formulations. So topical 5% imiquimod have been used, topical 5% 5-fluorouracil, and intralesional administrations of particular medications like 5-FU, methotrexate, and bleomycin have all been used as well. So some of these may have some evidence of actually improving the skin lesion or helping it to regress, but most of the time, again, it's going to be a surgical resection that is employed. Please check out my other lessons on dermatology conditions for more information on other types of skin conditions. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.